Today's program, our moderator is Kristen McQuarrie, a member of the Tribune Editorial Board, graduate of Rockford Guilford High School. Bet you didn't know that, huh? Member of St. Cajetan's Parish up there in Beverly. Joining her, Chicago Alderman Roderick Sawyer, whose uncle, I believe, Charles, was one of my students for many years. From the Sun-Times, Mary Mitchell, one half of the new Zebra Girl team. And if you didn't read about that over the weekend, you'll have to Google that. And last but not least, Radio personality, a man who's been known to be very generous with the money that he can secure if you're in his camp. Dan Proft. So if our speakers will come up to the table, we'll turn it over to them. Everybody seated. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. Jay and I talked a little bit about this idea for a discussion, and I just appreciate that as many of you could come in between your open houses and house hunting and closings and all that. That's so, right. <laughs> really appreciate it. Today, we'll not only talk about the reasons that Illinois is losing population, but hopefully come away with some suggestions on how to best tie the tourniquet. As many of you know, Illinois is seeing dramatic population loss, in addition to being a second to last destination state. So we are losing at both ends. We can debate the data points, net loss versus net gain, the decade long out migration of middle class black families from the south side, the slower than usual immigration patterns to places like Chicago, but the bottom line is that for four years running, this state has bled population and the trajectory is accelerating. In 2017, we dropped to the sixth largest state below Pennsylvania. Four years in a row is not a blip. It is not a glitch. It is a trend. It is alarming. The acceleration of residents moving away is not due to the weather. Mm -hmm. I think it is safe to say that no one is leaving Illinois for the utopia of Crown Point, Indiana, or the tropical paradise of Kenosha, Wisconsin. Although they are home to the Mars Cheese Castle, so that is a big draw, I'll give them that. Or Boise, Idaho, which was actually the fastest growing city in 2017, according to Forbes. Not a warm climate. The top reasons that I believe and that our editorial page believes people are leaving Illinois, high taxes, particularly property taxes in the suburbs, government dysfunction, government debt that taxpayers fully realize is on their backs, and violence in certain neighborhoods in Chicago. I don't need to give you the numbers on debt. I don't want to ruin your lunch. But there are legitimate questions at this point as to whether it can be paid off. Not how or when, but whether. What the outmigration shows is that taxpayers are fed up they grasp the extent to which their governments have borrowed and spent and promised. And you can look no further than the reaction to the Cook County soda tax, which was in fact a widespread revolt on being nickeled and dimed. Now, I don't want you to leave today feeling more anxious and perhaps despondent. My panelists hopefully will correct the situation, give us great ideas on how to get us out. But in case you are feeling particularly despondent, Jay has arranged to have a Zillow real estate representative at each table, and we can have your house on the market by 3 p.m. Without further ado, our talented and knowledgeable panel, they need no introduction, Alderman Roderick Sawyer, who gave a very compelling speech here a few weeks ago. I hope he talks a little bit about that. Award-winning columnist Mary Mitchell, who revealed in a recent column her own husband was kind of giving her a hard time maybe about staying in the city, and radio host and conservative activist Dan Proft, who talks about these issues on a routine basis. They're going to speak for about three to four minutes. I will try to keep them on schedule. 
And then uh, I'll follow up with a couple questions and then we have audience questions. So without further ado, we'll start with you, Alderman, please. And, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much. Uh, just very briefly, I, I, I do want to address this, and I did read your column, and it was very informative, um, although it made me feel bad as an elected official, um, that the premise of the article was the lack of trust in those in government and, and others. But I, I, not that I disagree with you, and I think there is a problem with that, but we have to understand that we've not only lost population over the last four years, the last four apportionments, we've lost six representatives in Congress. This has been a trend for decades, and, and it's very troubling. And what I want to hope that we talk about today, and, and, and I'm not the person that says I have the solutions, all the solutions, but we need to talk about how we fix this long term. Uh, we've had um, pension holidays and pension this and pension that in the past, and now as a newer representative here, um, I'm now responsible for paying for the sins of the past. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult. So sometimes we have to make difficult decisions. And I'm sorry that we have to do the things that we do, but if we did not do them, the city would be bankrupt. And, and it is a hard decision, and it's a job nobody wants to have. But I'm always open to talk about it and bring it out to the open. But if we do things like uh, think 21st century type ideas as opposed to 19th century ideas. Our sales tax system is still stuck in the 1900s, for example. Um, and I'll just give a real quick example. If we expanded our sales tax options and reduced our overall rate, I think the net effect would be bring in more money. Uh, the other thing that we have is lack of opportunity, at least where I live. I, I live in the south side of Chicago. My area is 98, 99 percent African American. You know, the problem is there's lack of opportunity in my area. People are leaving because they can get an opportunity to not just get a job, but to get a job in growth, get a job and get promoted, uh, buy houses, you know. And what I will say though, our housing stock is actually fairly reasonable in our area, but uh, what gets them are the ancillary things, the high taxes, and if you don't have an opportunity for increasing growth, you won't have an opportunity to gripe about taxes, but be willing to, and able to pay them. A lot of you here gripe about taxes, to be honest with you, but you can afford it. You can afford to pay the taxes. As, as stressful as it may be sometimes, you can write that check. I have those in my community that cannot write that check. They're making choices, whether to eat or to pay taxes, whether to send their children to school or pay taxes. You know, those are, hard, those are real life choices that have to be made, and I'm hoping that we can have a discussion and talk about that and how do we do better and, and keep people in Illinois and bring new people to Illinois. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So when you think about Illinois, you think about the land of Lincoln. And that means it brings certain images to your mind, justice, fairness, equality, crusading, that's what it, used to stand for. But now, when you talk about Illinois, and I just got back from a cruise vacation, Caribbean, and the first question they ask when you're on a cruise and you're in this captive audience is, where do you come from? Where do you live? And when I say Illinois, they give me condolences. <laughs> That's a problem. That's an image problem. And right now, I think the biggest issue that Illinois, the state, has to face, and Chicago, is that we are not losing, uh, we're not only losing uh, a, a large part of our population, we're losing middle class, we're losing working class, we're losing youth. You get young people who go away to college don't wanna come back here. They've gone to an environment that is much different from Illinois, and I'm just gonna have to put it on the table and tell it like I think it is, and that is, we have a big problem with segregation and inequality in the state of Illinois, and especially in the city of Chicago. We don't like to talk about that. But the migration movement from the south to the north was because people wanted to be able to pursue justice and happiness and liberty for their families. They wanted opportunities. And right now in Illinois, there aren't many opportunities. Where are the opportunities? 
How are the people in Inglewood and how are the people in South Shore going to get to the jobs? What jobs are there? There's wonderful jobs if you're high tech and you're highly educated. That's a good thing. I'm not knocking education, but you got a population of young people who cannot get those jobs. So if they're not working, why would they live here? Migration is because people go to the places where they're going to find opportunities. And that could be Boise, or that could be, you know, North Dakota. I, I met a man, uh, a gentleman during this cruise where he has a furniture manufacturing company. He's expanded to several other states. He's afraid to come to Illinois. He thinks I work, f we, he thinks we have a problem, a grave problem with our workforce. So our image across the country is a negative image. And I think the first thing we have to do is confront, why do we have this? Why do we still have such inequality in Illinois? Why are we still talking about, and people remember that we have a corrupt governor, that we, had, we sent two governors to prison back to back. Mm -hmm. Why are we still talking about, and the rest of the country talking about the fact that we have a revolving door when it comes to our criminal justice system? Mm -hmm. Black people particularly, and we've lost a large chunk of the black population, they have just packed up and left, mm -hmm. they want the same opportunities as everyone else. And if they can't find it in Illinois, they're going to go someplace else. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> it's uh, not as bad as you think. There's plenty of blame to go around, and we're working on it. What are you laughing at? That's the explanation that we've accepted from politicians in both parties for as long as I've been in politics in this state, which is 1994. Who, who are you laughing at? Honestly. This is the worst governed state in the history of the nation by the metrics, and we're working on it. It's not as bad as you think. There's plenty of, game, uh, plenty of blame to go around. You know who gives me that three-pronged answer that he then distributes to the caucus? That comes from Steve Brown, Mike Madigan's spokesman. Because he walks down Michigan Avenue, he sees people shopping in the stores. So, you know, obviously, easy extrapolation from that anecdote, things are fine. Or they're not too far from fine. What do you hear from uh, my uh, colleagues on this panel? Uh, modernize the sales tax to get more revenue for the city. Right, because we're government-centric. It's a marketing problem. Just a marketing problem, is that right? <laughs> well, the data suggests otherwise. And here's what everybody says. I'm for good government. I'm a fiscal conservative. There is not one non-fiscal conservative in public office in this state. The fiscal conservatives are killing us. Honestly, take a look at what this state has become, how barbaric it has become. Chesterton said that he who is given into un uh, unreason is ready for unkindness. We are an unkind state because we are an unreasonable state. We have taken unreasonable positions. We tell ourselves we're for good government. I read it on the editorial pages of the Sun-Times and the Tribune all the time, and they endorse the same government. Brady and Durkin, Republican leaders in the General Assembly, have been there for a combined 40 years. Cullerton and Madigan, Democrat leaders in the General Assembly, have been there for a combined 80 years. But you guys want good government. Get serious. People are leaving because they're tired of every time they turn around, some political hack is grabbing them by the collar and saying, give me your lunch money. They're sick of it. And it's not funny. People have been hurt by this state. People are fleeing the state to go to states that have better services for the development of the disabled. It's not just about taxes, but it is about taxes. You know, gosh, let's unravel this mystery. Why are people leaving? The Simon Institute at SIU, 50% of the state wants to leave. 50% of 13 million people want to leave. And they say the main reason is taxes. But what do they really mean? What are they really trying to say? That's the response you get from the political class. This is a joke. Unless you want to start leveling with yourselves, 
You're not going to be able to level with your duly elected representatives at the city level, the county level, the state level, or any level. This will continue to be a kleptocracy. This will continue to be a Diana Republic. We'll continue to celebrate the king kleptocrats of both parties. And people will leave. And, you know, here's the thing about it. And Mary mentioned it. Terrible schools, no opportunities. Right. That's not in every urban center. So something is unique here. Not every urban center has the highest black unemployment rate in the country. Chicago does. So something's unique here. And what do we do? Same people, same party, same ideas, 100 years in the city. Same people, same party, 50 years at the state. And, and by the way, I'm not absolving Republicans because they're the junior partners to all of this nonsense and chaos and terrible public policy. This has taken a bipartisan, oh, bipartisan, that's a fun word, that's a positive word. This has been a bipartisan effort to destroy one of the great states in the nation, and they've done it. So the question is not what's happened, the question is what are you gonna do about it? Thanks, Dan. So in terms of what we're going to do about it, there's, there are a couple questions here that relate to something I was going to ask Alderman Sawyer about. Um, that is, we have a Cook County assessor race that people believe might maybe bring some relief to some of these communities where there is uh, proven regressivity. So each of you, could you address whether or not you think a change in the assessor's office, a change in the way, in the fundamental structure of property taxes, at least in Cook County, um, would change out migration and to Alderman Sawyer, you endorsed Joe Berrios. Can you please explain why? Yes, I end of course I can. I endorsed Joe Berrios in the beginning of the term when we had our early endorsement sessions and we had a vigorous discussion in the room and our vote turned out to be in favor of Joe Berrios and I went along with the majority which we agreed to. Now to answer your question, um, I think there's been a broken assessment system for a very long time. Uh, not just with Joe Berrios going past Joe Berrios, that system has been flawed and it does favor those that are wealthy and well to do and that can afford to uh, seek justice. And I think that there is some merit to overhauling that assessment system, making it more fair and where you don't need as much activity to appeal your property taxes. So. I, to the short answer, yes, I, I did endorse him based on my involvement in being a commitment in the Democratic Party, uh, but I do think that the system is not fair and it needs a massive overhaul. Just, just to push you a little bit more on that, I mean, sure. this is an issue that dramatically affects your ward, and you talked earlier about people having to make decisions between paying taxes or sending their kids to school, et cetera. It has been proven in independent reports that this is a property tax system that is broken. Why, why wouldn't you at least sit it out? Why wouldn't you withdraw your endorsement? Why wouldn't you actually push for change instead of going along with this assessor? Uh, and we can have a whole discussion about this. I, I decided to be a member of the Democratic Party when I ran for Democratic Commitment. That means sometimes, uh, even though I may not vote for the ultimate nominee, I support the party choice. and that. And I do that because we try to push African-American candidates all the time to be a part of the system and we push them to run for elective office and to be supported by the party and we expect the party to have that same endorsement even though those individual committeemen do not vote for that person in that room if that person comes out and it's an African-American I expect everybody in that party to support that African-American candidate no more different than I'm supporting Joe Berrios right now even though he may have not been my preferred choice in that room. But, but that's the problem. But yeah. that's the problem. Because if you know and you don't agree with it, it's, we got to get down to the root of the political system well, that, say, that says that everybody has to follow the structure that's laid out. It's, it hasn't worked. Well, actually, I did not say that. I said that me, I chose to be a member of the Democratic Party, and I can do that. I fully expect people that are on the outside, that are activists, that are interested in the parties, not interested in the party system, but interested in the, in the best candidate, to do what they have to do. I'm trying to fight this from the inside. Right. That's just me. Right. I don't say anybody, you know, I'm not forcing anybody or I'm not putting I, I, any, any pressure on anybody right. to say you have to do what I do. I get that, Alderman. I get that. And I'm, I'm not saying do. it even personally. Right. I'm saying that we are stuck 
with a political system that everyone keeps doing the same thing over and over and over and over, and no one's held out accountable for the outcome. I mean, the, set, the assessor's office that we say is flawed, and a system that is flawed has been flawed since I came to the Sun-Times 25 years ago. That's ridiculous. And it has been, yes. So, so at what point do we throw all that out and say, we're going we're gonna to try something else, we're going to try something new? At what point do we do that? We have an opportunity to do that at every election. Those that vote, I mean, when, no. we're, voting, now when we're voting at a 30% clip, now who are we placing blame on? I vote every election. I've never missed an election in my entire life. There are those out there that have never voted or have not voted. I'm, I'm just saying I'm doing what I'm doing as being a member of the party. I chose to be a member of the party. Most people don't choose to be a member of the party, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I'm actually encouraged those that are outside. I've been on the outside before. I, worked, I was an activist for a long time. I worked on the outside. I chose now to be a part of the inside to try to work to get equality from my side. I'm not trying to disparage. Matter of fact, I encourage those on the outside to do what they do. Get involved. Vote. Like Barack Obama said, pick up a board and start signing petitions. Do something. But we have to do something in order for us to change the system. I chose to change it from the inside. I encourage those that are on the outside to do the same. Change it. Vote for whoever they want to vote for. If there's a change, make, make, make that change. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a personnel problem, um, but it's, uh, it's also, it's, a, it's ultimately a policy problem. I mean, is anybody confused? I mean, I, look, I agree people get the representation they deserve, which is kind of, you're tr tr politely saying it, that is the point that you're making. Um, but is there anybody confused that the property tax system has destroyed the South Suburbs? Is anybody confused about that? So people in public office know that then? So have you had opportunity? Have you had any time yet? I know we have very long probationary periods in this state to do anything on problems you know exist, on problems that you know are metastasizing. We, we, the probationary period is like into the decades here. We've got to give people a long runway to do anything. Um, but uh, since we know that the property tax system has destroyed the majority minority South suburbs, um, just because you support this uh, fungible assessor versus that fungible assessor, you could propose something that changes the way we do property tax classification in Cook County to bring it in line to the other 101 counties in this state, or to do something even more revolutionary, maybe to pick our heads up and look around at the rest of the country that isn't doing things the way that we're doing and is doing them successfully, unlike how we're doing them, and say, well, over there in Indiana, they have a 1% hard cap on property taxes as a percentage of home value. 2% for farmland, 3% for commercial. Easy as one, two, three. And Indianans, Hoosiers as they're called, I don't know if you know, they, uh, they uh, pay half of what we pay in property taxes. And they have local units of government, they have police forces, and they have schools, and they have fire departments. And they're not destroying their communities by using people's homes as collateral for somebody else's pension, which is what we're doing in Illinois. So we could say we're going to put handcuffs on local units of government by imposing this hard cap as a percentage of home value. You shall not spend over that. And then that creates a daisy chain effect. You put handcuffs on the local people. Then you make the state live up to its constitutional responsibility to be the primary funder of K-12 through education, which would force the state to get out of all kinds of other businesses it's no good at, like trying to woo HQ2 and other quixotic adventures and focus on its core responsibilities like funding K through 12 education and then they have to get from here to here and so you essentially incentivize and demand fiscal responsibility which people talk about but don't really care about at both the local level and leverage that at the state level and then you get uh, people's home equity returned to them. You get schools funded at a particular level that can educate children. They prove it in the suburbs and in the Catholic schools. And uh, now you got something cooking. Um, or you can say, you know, Fritz Kage versus uh, Joe Berrios. Uh, Kage will have less family members on his payroll than Joe Berrios, so that's good. And, and then, and so and that's going to be somehow transformative. It's not going to be transformative. There's not one idea that's been proposed. This guy is less corrupt than that guy. That's every election in this state. Big deal. So this is a question for Mary and me, and I'm going to make Mary go first. 
How do you respond to criticism that liberal media bias in the mainstream media is analogous to people leaving Illinois, that readers have also lost faith in newspapers? Go. <laughs> I, I want to say, huh? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think people pick up and leave uh, the state because of the media bias or proposed uh, perceived media bias. I think people pick up and leave the state for real reasons, and I'll give you an example. Uh, if a young person comes out of high school and decides they're not going to go to college and tries to find a job, a decent job, a, a job that will be able to, you know, put them, get them a little ragged car maybe, or, you know, help them uh, pay their t school tuition at community college, they try to find that job. They cannot find that job. Why is that? Because Illinois, at this point, has made sure that a certain percentage of the population does not get educated to fill those jobs. That the skill, they're not taught at vocational skills in high school. We used to learn vocational skills. You know, I, when I graduated from high school, I could be a secretary. I can go out and feed my family by being a secretary because I learned that in school. Or you could be a carpenter, you could be a plumber, you could do those sorts of things. Right now, those jobs don't exist anymore. So what is that young person going to do? That young person is going to pack up and move out. Not because of my column, not because of the editorials. <laughs> They're going to do it because people want to be able to provide for family. The folks who are stuck here, I'm going to use the word stuck. I'm stuck. I got a 90-year-old mother. Where am I going? I can't uproot my mother and take her to, you know, Florida with me. So I have to stay here. And there are a lot of people in that situation. So I don't think media bias is the reason or can be, uh, uh, is one of the reasons why people don't, uh, why people are leaving the state. Well, it's not a reason that people are leaving, but it, it does um, feed the cynicism because basically the press corps in this city and the state is the big government press corps. So they fold it in. I mean, what, you think the press hasn't been responsible for advancing all these terrible public policies and these terrible public policymakers over the past 50 years? They haven't? Should we take a walk down memory lane at some of the governors and legislators and county commissioners that, uh, and county board chairmen and on and on and on, aldermen that the Sun-Times and the Tribune has endorsed, that they have written encomiums about, forget endorsement, but they don't bear any responsibility? Of course they do. They're a stakeholder. They're the fourth estate. How they doing? How they doing keeping track and, and holding the, 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 the other three estates accountable, which is the original <coughs> rationale for the fourth estate? Uh, we don't have a political ruling class? No? <laughs> really? Hmm? How, how, how are they doing? This press corps in Chicago and Springfield, they're complicit. And so people say, you know, that the whole thing is a big fix. And it is. This entire state is one series of Ponzi schemes on top of another. That's what it is. And what does the press do? Yeah, you know, occasionally you, you get Jason Grotto write a pretty good series about property taxes. Um, and, you know, occasionally you do something about, I don't know, Mike Madigan's conflicts of interest, Ed Burke's conflicts of interest, something, oh, excuse me, I know he's here tomorrow. Don't tell him I said that. Uh, you know, something like that, you know. And that's about it. Then we've done our job, pat ourselves on the back, and we're you know, carrying the torch for good government. So people throw up their hands. Here's the thing. Eric Hoffer, right, the, the longshoreman philosopher. Boy, could we use him in public office in Illinois. Common sense, but deep thinking. People don't change if they don't believe they're in control of their own destiny and they don't believe things can improve. They will not change. They will default, default to the status quo, and that's what we've done. And people in this state do not believe they are in control of their destiny because they think the system is rigged against them, and they do not believe they can improve their conditions because the system is rigged against them. And the press corps in this city and state is part of that fix. Dan. 
You wouldn't have really anything to talk about on the radio every day if it weren't for the work that the press corps did to uncover all of the scandals with Rod Blagojevich, College of DuPage, scandal after scandal, tollways, ROM schedule, we're in court right now, uh, all of the Barrio stories, the Quincy home case, which you love to talk about, again, a couple of reporters doing some shoe leather yes, reporting. I understand. Um, I understand it's, that, it's that a, I, I mentioned a couple, those are, those are more McDonald, stories. I, could go, I, I only had time to write down a few, yeah. but every single day you are talking about things on your radio show that are uncovered by news reporters, including the Tribune and the Sun-Times. So let's set the and record then, straight And, and on then that. who do you fold in with? <laughs> then who do you fold in with? I asked you, the question. You mentioned you a couple. It to me. You mentioned, you like, with? You mentioned a couple of incumbents that we endorsed. Yeah. We have endorsed. We endorsed probably 80 to 85 percent challengers and new candidates. We can't walk people into the ballot ballot box. I understand. But we try our best to highlight independent I know. incumbents in which there are not many and challengers. We we're working on it. I got cycle. it. Okay. We're working on it. There's only so much we can do. We're we're doing our part. Um, Alderman Sawyer, I think this might be for you. There's a there's a question about, well, there's a couple questions about Mike Madigan and that the, the increasing um, understanding that he is a big problem in Illinois politics seems to permeate every area of the state. So why do Democratic officials not stand up to what they know is a big problem in getting actual policy change in Springfield? Well, since I don't have a real direct relationship with Mike Madigan, um, matter of fact, I'm supporting one of his opponents in the election that affects me and my personal area, uh, we don't have a lot of interaction, but I will say that it is uh, one of the portions I will say that uh, Mr. Prof stated that people have a concern about 40 years or 80 years combined leadership and the same thing uh, to be a problem. Something that I would say that we need occasional breaths of leadership. I don't have a personal problem with Mike Madigan. I just follow my own tune. I, I, I vote based on my conscience and I support people based on how I work. And it's not necessarily about you know, someone telling me that I have to do this. So I, I, I think that when we talk about things like having term limits for certain legislative leaders, uh, executive branch term limits, I, I think that's something we should be looking at, particularly for governor. Uh, I like the system that, uh, for example, Atlanta has for their mayor. You can only run two consecutive terms, I believe. Then you would have to leave. Um, I think on your executive portion, you need to have changes from time to time so that you can have fresh, fresh breaths of opportunity, fresh perspectives. So uh, again, I don't have a real direct relationship with uh, Speaker Madigan, but uh, I think that's something we need to look at. Okay, thank you. I guess I'm supposed to be saying the names of people who are asking questions. Sorry. Um, rookie here. Uh, Linda Foreman asks about a progressive income tax, which it looks like if we get, if we have a Democratic governor, a Democratic General Assembly, they're Top of the list. We're hearing a lot about that this campaign season. Uh, there's a. Are there not enough rich people? To, there are not enough rich people to solve the revenue problem. How many new Florida residents do you want? Could you <laughs> respond to the progressive income tax as being the what will solve our problems? Who's who? Uh, for All who? of you. Uh, let's start with Dan. Go ahead. Well. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're just layering, you're just laying around more of it. I, I know. I mean, I know why uh, Pritzker and and Bi I mean, well, I know why Biz because he's a socialist, but I know why Pritzker is running on it is because you know it's popular. I know it's popular in the state. That's why he's running on it because we're economically illiterate. And so, to back to the point about we get the representation we deserve. Progressive income tax. Um, the woman who asked the question is precisely right. It's not enough rich people. And oh, by the way. Um, this is not a suicide pact to be a resident of Illinois. So people with the means to move will do so. Uh, and even if they have to come back and visit the kids, they'll get a condo downtown and they'll be in Florida or somewhere else 180 days a year where they don't pay income tax. Mm -hmm. And isn't that amazing, by the way, that Florida, a state that's bigger than Illinois and very diverse with big cities, zero income tax and lower property taxes than Illinois. And they have schools and police and fire and the whole thing. It's wild, isn't it? That somebody, could, so a state could actually do that with more than 13 million people and we can't do that with all of those taxes layered on. Progressive income tax, fine. Just, just you know, continue to, uh, uh, to, to drill the coffin into the ground. People will leave. Middle class families will get fleeced because that's, 
to the lady's point, that's where the real money is. It's middle income families. You can't 1% your way to a balanced budget. That's a lie. It's an economic fallacy spun by, you know, Chicago Press Corps editorial boards. <laughs> uh, so, so, so that's, that's, that's something that never, the Democrats ever, will pursue ever. because it's, this isn't about good public policy. This is about solving problems. This is about uh, Pritzker, just like Rahner, getting to wear the sash governor for a few years so it can be included in his epitaph. This is about somebody trying to leverage the office for, to enrich themselves like legislative leaders in both parties do and you know politicians up and down the food chain do. That's what this is about. You think they care about you? You think this is about you? Get real. Could I, um, Alderman, so, and yeah, go ahead. So this is the reason why I think that we are in the trouble and the spot we're in, because we don't listen to each other. We talk at each other. We're bombastic with each other. We don't listen. So whether you talk about progressive or regressive taxes or whatever taxes you're talking about, how is the money being spent? How do we divide up the resources in the state of Illinois because that's the big problem. Whatever pot of money you have, you've got to divide it up. You got to use it to support the, 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 the residents of the state of Illinois. And what we've done with our money has been shameful. It, it's shame, I'm, I'm sorry if people think that, you know, you should live higher on the hog when you, when you retire than you did when you were working. I'm sorry about that. Because that's just not even, that's not even possible. That's not sustainable. Yeah. There's no way that's gonna happen. You know, when I leave, I know, when I leave my job, I know that I gotta reduce, I can, I won't be going to the spa. Not like I am when I'm working. But in Illinois, because for some reason, we believe money is just growing on trees, and we have it to give out, we are shortchanging we are shortchanging the residents. On the bottom line is there are people who have great needs in this state and those needs and those services are not being delivered. And because they're not being delivered, people are going to the states where they can deliver. That's the problem. So when someone says to me about progressive taxes or, or any kind of taxes, I grab my purse because I know what's coming down later. Thank you. I hope you still get to do the cruise when you retire, Mary. Okay? Maybe not the spa, but you still should be able to go to the Caribbean. Okay? Alderman. Very quickly. I, I, I think that the problem is currently that we have a regressive tax, and we have to do something about that. And whatever you want to call it, if you want to call it a progressive tax or a fairer tax, I think what we're trying to do is keep middle class people here, give relief to the working poor, and ask those at the top level to pay a little bit more. I don't think that's unconscionable. I don't care what you call it, but I think that if we can come up with a system that is fair to the majority of us, which is include those, the bulk of us in the middle class that are working just to get by, doing okay, but you know we don't have all the luxuries that a lot of people have, we want to give relief to the most of those. I don't care what you call it. Uh, I think that we need to be involved in discussing a fair tax system. What are the numbers? How about, how about numbers? If you, yeah, this is, everybody says fair. What's, what's fair? What's the, what are the numbers? You've One obviously given us a lot of thought. More than fewer. That's, that's fair. What, what, what's the number? I said those that support the, the masses as opposed to the Yeah, I know, but, but what's the number? That has to translate I don't know to the a number. number. Right. I, don't, I don't know the number. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. You, you know what the number is? The number for all these things? More. <laughs> that's the number. Uh, so uh, let's just touch on a couple more questions and then we have to wrap up. But there was a question for Dan. Um, we know you're very involved in the gubernatorial primary. There's a question wanting to know what is the logic of getting behind a, an, a conservative candidate in a blue state who can't win the general election? Well, I reject the premise, which is something I often have to do with people in the city and state. Um, first of all, uh, the idea a conservative candidate can't win is not true. Not true. 
Uh, Peter Fitzgerald's a conservative candidate. He won a statewide election. By the way, I, you know, that was a long time ago. Well, guess what? It's been a long time since Republicans were routinely winning statewide elections. We've gotten moderates and surrender Republicans like Mark Kirk who've been crushed too. So it's a little bit more complicated than this conservative liberal construct that kind of the passively engaged want to, f f uh, and the anti-conservatives want to impose on conservatives, okay? That's not the facts. That's number one. So Jeannie Ives can win. And oh, by the way, Jeannie Ives is the only candidate who can win. And this is the message I've been delivering, and some people listen to it, and most people won't. I'm used to that. Um, Bruce Rauner is the only Republican candidate in the primary who cannot win. He is a dead man walking politically. The Bruce Rauner experiment is over. Mark my words, hear it, record it right now, and I've said it before. When you are at 25% reelect, 25% reelect after with 100% name ID and $150 million in branding, that means you are over in politics. He is not going to win. So what Republicans are doing, much like they did when they renominated Mark Kirk last cycle, rather than put up a challenger to him, is saying, we can see the race. That's what you're saying if you renominate Bruce Rauner. And the reason he's going to lose is because he betrayed everyone he made promises to, he betrayed everything he said he was going to do, and there should be accountability for betrayal. Otherwise, what the hell is the point of a Republican Party? We don't care. Stab me in the back, and I'll be right there as long as the check's big enough. That's inspired. That's principled. Is that the way you want to organize a party, no matter which party you want you belong to? Would you do the same thing if J.B. Pritzker won and he did the same thing to the Democrats four years from now? If he had adopted my policy agenda, would Democrats be happy with that and say, oh, well, the big checkbook? That's what Republicans are doing, and I'm not going to be a part of it. I'm a conservative by choice. I'm a Republican by necessity in this state, but it's not that necessary for me to be a Republican. No way we're going down that way. I'm not going down that way, and a lot of other conservatives aren't. There has got to be accountability for betrayals in addition to betrayals that are terrible public policy. And if there isn't, there is no, there, if you're not accountable to yourself as a party, how is anybody going to believe you'll be accountable to them? So people can make the choice to continue doing the same things and being political prognosticators. Everybody who has a passing uh, interest, knowledge of politics, they're great political handicappers. They know exactly how things are going to turn out. Stopping a political handicapper and start acting in furtherance of what you would like to see happen. You never know. It might just. Um, could I have the two of you, um, Alderman and Mary Mitchell, weigh in on the governor's race, either side, any predictions, any, any sweeping change that you see on that, on the Democratic side? Sweeping change. Yeah. Are any of the candidates, if elected, are you taken with any of their proposals um, on change, on s stemming the exodus, et cetera? I'm gonna let you go. Yeah. Well, Hot again. potato. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this I, is the part I'm where you say who you're endorsing and why. No, I, I'm, I'm more concerned about the original premise of this conversation on why people are leaving Illinois. I, I think that we need to get back to that co part of the conversation and whatever, even if in the elected politics, how that plays into that. So I'll, I'll be supportive of anyone that can, you know, bring industry back to Illinois, that can uh, increase job training, give opportunities for people in my community so that they can stay, so that more people can come here to Illinois. If that's Jeannie Ives, God, you know, God bless her. She can do that and she can show me she can do that, then I'm going to vote for her. Trust me, I, I, I will vote for her if she, if she could show me that. We welcome you aboard. I don't think she can, but if she did show me that, I would love to look at it. I'm an open person. I would be glad to look at whatever she has that can show me that she's interested in keeping black people in Illinois working in good paying jobs, union jobs and other private sector good paying jobs the way they can raise families and, and, and keep up their families and retire and buy homes and buy goods and services in my community to regenerate our tax bases so that we can get more people to be here. If they can do that, I'm with them. How, how's your party been at that? We're doing all right. I mean, it's, Are you know, you? we're doing okay. We're this in my neighborhood, I mean, we're, we're this working on my neighborhood. This entire conversation is about how you're not doing all right. No, statewide. In my neighborhood, we're working on that. Sh 
Yeah, we're working on it. Yes, we're doing it. Not as bad as you think. No, we're doing it. My block is full. Really? My neighborhood is full and my neighborhood Chicago is growing. Chicago has the highest black unemployment rate in the country. Yes, we do. Statewide, we do. Yes, we do. It, and that's no. part of a conversation I would love to have. I don't know if we have enough time for that as well. But part of that Nothing is, to see uh, here. Everything's fine. No, no, I didn't say that at all. No, I started my conversation stating that. Come on. So please don't put words in my mouth. Okay? We all have, we know we have a problem. And if we can stop talking about what things you're great at, we can talk about the real problem here today, about how we can fix the problem instead of who's to blame for the problem. And that's problem, our, part of our problem all the time. We're always talking about who's to blame for the problem. The Democrats are to blame. The Republicans are to blame. These people are to blame. Well, we're to blame. Well, our, our you know, how are we talk about fixing? I thought we were going to talk about fixing. Yeah, let's, well, let's I, get I, to I fix. propose fixes, but... but do, no, do, I haven't heard you propose one fix. Well, I, I propose, heard you propose a lot of blame, what, 1%, but not one, one fix. 1% uh, cap on property tax and a percent of home value. So there's And one. I would love to look at that. I, I, well, I would have I, a problem I'm happy to show that. it to you. And I would have to look at it. Can I ask a question? So the people in charge are not to be held accountable. Is that what I understand? No, I said that we're... We're, we're, we're not spending our time placing blame instead of working on solutions. That's what I said. Uh -huh. okay, okay, so we need to we do need to right. wrap up. Everybody needs to get back to their open houses. I understand. Um, <laughs> so if you could each just take not even a minute, but out of everything you've heard today, of everything you read, of everything you know, your life experience, what is one thing that you think could actually stem the exodus, um, turn the state around, get us on the right path? One thing. What do you think, Alderman? One thing. I would say, I, mean, I, I, I heard this earlier, and I, I've talked about it previously. Uh, it's the equivalent of a Marshall Plan for Illinois. You know, a, a massive public works jobs program that we can hire and at the same time improve our decaying infrastructure. We can kill kind of two birds with one stone. And I think that's one thing that can help us resolve our problem, at least in my community. Thank you. Mary? Jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Dan. I mean, you know, unicorns, 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 <laughs> unicorns. Uh, the, the, the one thing I would say is, is what I propose. You have to do things that are transformative. And if you, if you reduced and locked in, if you structurally changed the property tax system to put those caps in, to put handcuffs on politicians' spend, to give people their home equity back, to give people in uh, poorer to uh, uh, lower middle income communities the opportunity to actually access home ownership, which they can't now with confiscatory property taxes, it wouldn't even make sense. If you can do that, then you start to, there is that daisy chain effect with property taxation, with people dropping roots here, with having a stake in the game, and it imposes discipline at the local level that can be leveraged at the state level level as well as policy focus for that spend that Mary Mitchell was talking about. So I think that is a solution that could transform this state or do the most to transform it the quickest. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you.